this lecture, we're going to be looking at class and educational achievement and specifically looking at the external factors which relate to education and class and how they can contribute to the trends in education and class. Now, we've already covered the trends previously in, and pointed out that middle class students do tend to do better than working class students. And so this is where we're going to look at why that is. Why are we seeing that trend? Now, before we do that, we do need to think about what we mean by class, because it's not a simple um, term to quantify in order to use it in research. Um, traditionally, class, we think about working class, middle class, upper class, um, kind of terminology and we still use that kind of terminology today but the traditional definitions of social class were based around wealth occupation and education now this has its own issues because in some regards you can be have a very high level of education but not be very wealthy or not have a very good occupation um, you could have a very good occupation, but not have a very good education. Um, you could be asset wealthy, but cash poor. And what that means is that you have perhaps have a lot of um, wealth in things like housing, cars, stocks, businesses and things like that. But you have very little in the way of ready cash in order to pay bills or groceries and things like that. So this traditional class system is actually quite difficult um, to use in the sense of where do you fit within this class system? So to give you an example, using the categories or categorization that the traditional system uses, based on my wealth, I'd be working class. I have no savings. I don't earn a massive amount of money. Um, I don't own my own house. I don't have any assets. So therefore I would be considered under the wealth category, I would be considered working class. However, my occupation and my education put me in the middle class bracket because I am a professional, apparently, um, as a teacher. And I have a postgraduate certificate of education, which is kind of like half a master's type thing. Love to have a master's, can't afford it. Um, I'd also like a PhD. I'd love to be Dr. Constable, but I don't think that, no, definitely not going to happen. Too much money. Um, anyway, back to the point. This kind of system means that not everyone's really sure where they fit. So in 2007, the British Social Attitudes Survey came up with a new system of um, classes. And this system had seven different classes, the precariat, emergent service class, traditional working class, new affluent workers, technical middle class, established middle class and the elite. And what they did is for this categorization, they looked at economic capital. So look at your income, your savings, if you're in your own house, how much the house is worth, your assets, things like that. They look at your social capital. And that's the number and status of the people someone knows. So basically looks at who your friends are, who your colleagues are. So the more um, important people that you know, the higher up the class system you are. And then it looks at cultural capital, which in this sense, because we're going to use this term again, and it's got different meanings in different contexts. But in this definition, cultural capital is defined as the extent and nature of cultural interests and activities. So it's looking at what your hobbies are, what your interests are, and they kind of, in terms of looking at it in terms of mass culture, which is mass produced, commonly accepted by everybody type culture, and um, high culture, which is things that are considered posh, to, to put a blunt word on it. It's posh stuff, ballet, opera, croquet, um, polo, things like that, things that we associate 
with the rich and powerful. So again, there is that problem where people perhaps could fit into more than one class. The, and the British Social Attitude Survey didn't particularly clarify what was what. So again, looking at myself, I could be part of the new affluent workers with a decent wage, decent um, amount of um, disposable income, but then I could also still be part of the established middle class because of my social capital. Um, a lot of my friends are professionals, university graduates, um, teachers, and um, as well as my cultural interests tend to be, well, not posh, but also I'm um, not, um, not necessarily what would be considered working class or popular culture. I, I do like going to the movies and things, uh, films and things like that, but I also like reading and documentaries and yes, I'm a geek. We, we've established that one. Okay. So using, although sociologists use the term social class in terms of looking at educational achievement, what they're actually talking about is the advantaged versus the disadvantaged. And we kind of talked about this before um, when we were looking at measuring educational achievement. But what we're looking at here is people who or students who are considered the disadvantaged are those who qualify for free school meals or have done in the last six years. Children who are looked after, so they're in care, they're adopted, um, they're under the care of social services in some way, shape or form, um, or have previously been looked after children. So maybe they spent some time in foster care or private fostering where another member of the family looked after them um, or a friend of the family looked after them. Um, but they're now back with their parents or they were adopted at birth. So even though, um, as we said, adopted would be looked after children, if your adoption took place at birth, for example, you would be considered a previously looked after child. Now, again, it depends on whether the adoption was a private adoption or a state adoption. Private adoptions tend to be more private um, and less there's there's less issues. Not to say there aren't issues, but there's there are slightly less issues with a private adoption from birth. It's usually a case of the biological parent um, doesn't want to keep the child themselves, um, but they've met the adoptive parents and are happy with the, them taking the child at birth. And finally, they include children whose parents are in the armed services. Now, as we said before, these children are considered um, part of the disadvantage because they may have had a very broken education, moving around different bases, different places. Um, it may be that they haven't at all, but under the definition, they are considered the disadvantaged children, despite the fact that they may not be economically disadvantaged. So for sociologists, when they're talking about um, working class, or they're really talking about is those who are clarified classified as the disadvantaged and those who are not classified as the disadvantaged. Okay, so one of the ways they do this is they, they look at um, free school meals and pupil premium as a way of measuring the advantage and disadvantage. But is that really the best way? Well, some would argue it is because it creates standardization. It gives an equal measure across populations. Everyone is measured by the same standards. Free school meals are, or people who are eligible for free school meals are eligible if their household income is under £16,000 a year, regardless of where you live in the country, regardless of your um, ethnicity or sta status or anything like that. If you are have a household income of under £16,000 a year, you are entitled to free school meals. That doesn't mean you necessarily take them, my I, I was eligible growing up, but my mum made us take sandwiches every day. Um, and um, it allows for that um, quantification in a way that is standardised. All sociologists can use that same criteria. Now, it's not 
great because um, it's reductionist. It's because it's not looking at why these people are eligible for free school meals other than that they have a low um, household income. Um, and it's not really, so as we said, somebody could be asset rich but cash poor, which means that they're eligible for free school meals. Um, or they could be, have a very good background and be eligible but not take it up but they're still considered part of the disadvantage. So it's reductionist because it's taking something that's very, very complex, the class system, and reducing it down to one criteria to identify who is in what class, okay? So it has its strengths, it has its weaknesses. There is never going to be a perfect way to establish class um, in sociological research, so there does need to be a little bit of standardization and a little bit of generalization. So what do we mean when we talk about external factors? Now, external factors are any uh, the factors which are outside of the education system. So these are influences on your educational achievement that don't come from the education system. And I say the education system and not schools, because there are, uh, when we're talking about internal factors, which will be the next lesson, the le next lecture, we will be looking at, the, at not only what happens in schools, but within the education system. So policies, processes and things like that. When looking at the external factors in educational achievement according to class, they can be grouped into three main areas. First, we're going to look at material deprivation. Then we're going to look at cultural deprivation. And finally, we're going to look at cultural capital, which kind of links into the cultural deprivation, but it is also slightly um, a side to it. Now, you may have heard cultural capital being thrown around by government and by media and all these other people. Um, their definition of cultural capital and the sociologist's definition of cultural capital, which comes from um Bordeaux, I'm actually check that. Um, yep, Bordeaux is actually quite different. It's almost like they've kind of bastardized the term, and no, I'm not swearing. Um, they, they've changed it and adapted it to fit their needs and to fit their agenda. But we're going to look at it from Bordeaux's perspective and what Bordeaux meant by cultural capital. OK, so although there are multiple factors, there are, we, we've kind of grouped them. So let's look, first of all, at the material factors which impact educational achievement by social class. And when we talk about material deprivation, what we said, what we mean is people who are lacking the necessary materials and economic means to function efficiently and comfortably and in this context within the education system. So it's about not having the material um, means, the economic means to be able to engage in education comfortably and efficiently. Okay, And this again can be broken down into two types. So there's two types of material deprivation. The first comes from Douglas in 1964, and he refers to it as home and health. So he argues that lower income families are disadvantaged in education um, for a number of reasons, which are almost all the start again, which are often cumulative in nature. But in terms of things like overcrowded housing, they may be living in a small flat or a small house where there's lots of people and that can lead to not having somewhere quiet or specific to study, maybe trying to do homework on your lap or work it around smaller children that might be in the home um, or other people in the home. So it's quite loud, quite um, distracting. And also overcrowded housing can have health implications. Um, you know how, and um, this we're talking pre-COVID times here. There you, there's the um, autumn term bug, 
that does the rounds around school. You spend the summer outside, lots of fresh air, and then you come back to school where you're trapped in a classroom with 30 other people and bugs do the rounds. It's the same concept in an overcrowded house. You come home with a bug and you will more than likely pass it on to other people in your house. And we can link this to COVID actually, in that um, the working class were more affected by COVID than the middle classes because of overcrowding, because of close proximity. And a lot of the time the working class weren't able to work from home. So they were still having to go into work, possibly supermarkets, NHS, um, essential services type jobs. And then they're coming home to an overcrowded house. So the, the, the virus could spread a lot easier. Um, Douglas also talks about poor diet. So um, in terms of the, those who are from low income families, they're more likely to have poorer diets. Unfortunately, um, cheap food tends to be low in nutrition, high in um, not very good stuff. Um, tastes good, but it's not necessarily good for you. So it can lead to children having lower immune systems. Um, it can mean that they're perhaps not staying full for long for longer. Um, something like I read somewhere, and I can't remember where it was now, but McDonald's is deliberately engineered so that you only feel full for a couple of hours after you've eaten it. Whereas a, a home cooked meal will keep you full for quite some time. And they talk about uh, certain breakfast cereals that are going to keep you full until lunchtime, things like that. The cheap, cheap and cheerful foods, which do taste good, um, are usually full of additives, chemicals and sugars and salts. Work, but low income families can't afford necessarily the organic foods or fresh um, foods that perhaps the middle classes can. Now, there is nothing wrong with things like tinned veg and tinned foods and things like that um, in a balanced diet. Um, but Douglas in 1964, and obviously things have changed quite a bit since 1964 in terms of. Um, tinned foods and um, processed foods and things like that. But it is still the case that um, children in low income families are more likely to get things like rickets and scurvy, um, which are vitamin deficiencies. He also talks about how um, low income families, children are more likely to take on part time work earlier. So that's going to split their time. They're not going to be able to spend as much time studying. Now, things would are different now than they were when I was younger. I had my first job, I think I was about 14 or 15, and it was babysitting and it was for family members. So it wasn't exactly difficult. Um, but I had my first kind of full time job at, or full outside the family type job when I was 15 in the summer between my year 10 and year 11, um, because it was a case when my parents were like, you can work now, so get yourself a job if you want money. Um, so whereas now that there's more regulations in terms of who, when you can work, how many hours you can work um, and things like that. So low income families can often um, not force, but push children into getting part time work younger, which gives less time for study and less time for um, education. And finally, he talks about the fact that the lack of nursery provision. Now, we talked a little bit about this previously when we talked to education policy in the UK at the age of I think it's three, you are given 30 hours free of nursery provision. Um, anything extra, you have to top up yourself. And nurseries are expensive, so it's quite likely that low income families are unable to send their children to nursery and receive that early education. So children, um, as we've 
discussed previously who go to nursery are more likely to start school at a higher cognitive ability, higher language ability, higher social and emotional development, which can put them in at an advantage over other students. The other side of material deprivation is what's referred to as the hidden cost of education. Now, in the UK, we have free state education. You can choose to go private if you like, but every child in the UK between the ages of five and 18 are entitled to free education. Now, Bull in 1980 argues that it's never really been free. It, it, it's a misnomer to say that we have free education because there are hidden costs involved. Things like school uniform, equipment, stationery, lunches, trips, extracurricular activities, additional materials for things like food tech, art, technology, and also things like homework requirements, computer access, which has been very much highlighted during the current lockdowns and COVID situation, where they were talking about how the gap between the advantaged and disadvantaged has widened because the advantaged were able to access remote learning. Disadvantaged, not so much. They may have had one computer between four two or three children. They may have been on metered internet um, access, so would not have been able to engage in the remote live lessons and things like that. So as much as we might say the education system is free in the UK, it's not really. There are costs involved. And Tanner points out in 2003 that this financial burden that is felt by these low income families can lead to children being stigmatised and bullied, which might then deter children, those children from entering into further and higher education. And it's things that they may be stigmatised because they can't afford to go on the school trips or that they can't afford the latest football boots or fight or other equipment that is required for school. They might be in hand-me-down school uniforms. Um, I mean, a lot of the time you see year sevens at the beginning of their first year and they look like sacks tied in the middle. They've got bags bigger than they are. They've got blazers that are three sizes too big because parents want to buy one blazer that they grow into over the course of their time at the college. Um, but the, these kind of financial implications for some families can be quite in, in, intensive. So that can affect educational achievement. If you, if you haven't got the equipment to do the work, that can make it very difficult. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is cultural deprivation. Okay, And what we, we mean by this is cultural deprivation outside of school suggests that the working class lack the necessary views, attitudes and knowledge to support necessary and support necessary for educational success. So what they're suggesting is that their habitat, which is a word that comes from um, Bordeaux, I think. No, yes, Bordeaux. Um, there's too many B names, I get confused. It comes from Bordeaux. He suggests that the working class or the disadvantaged habitat or culture is not um, the same as the schools. So therefore, there are working class students are at a disadvantage. So there are three main ways that students can be culturally dis deprived when from that outside of school. So the first is parental interest. And Douglas and Feinstein in 1964 and again in 1998 said that, that um, working class parents are less likely to take an interest in their children's educational success. They're generally less supportive, lack in, dis lacks in discipline, less motivating, and less likely to engage with schools in terms of parents' evenings or um, in supporting their children um, compared to middle class parents. We've then got Hyman and Sugarman and Bordeaux who talk about this, this habitat, these values and beliefs. 
And Hyman and Sugarman suggest that there are extreme differences that exist between the working class and the middle class. And Sugarman identifies these foci, what he refers to as um, working class foci, that's F-O-C-I, and middle class foci, which are at extreme opposites to each other. And as we said before, the education system is a middle class institution. So the education system is going to be built up around these beliefs. So you've got um, Trudeman identifies in the, in the working class fatalism, meaning that this is how things are. It's almost like believing in um, destiny. I am working class. This is how it's meant to be. Okay. Collectivism being a, a strong belief in the group. I am part of the group and I cannot do anything against the group. Present time orientation, which means they're more concerned with what's happening now than the past or the future. And immediate gratification. I want the reward now. I don't want it in five years time. I don't want it in 10, 10 months time. I want it now. I want to feel the success now. Okay, when compared to the middle classes who are um, whose foci include optimism um, and not in terms of optimism, in terms of feeling happy all the time. But there's room for growth. There's room for movement. And I can do whatever I want to do. I'm not I'm not confined by anything. Um, individualism. So it's all about themselves and they're, they're, they're more interested in what's to their benefit rather than the group. Um, delayed gratification. So here they're more likely to um, to be looking at um, where where is this going to get me? What can I get in the future? So it's kind of like I'm going to work hard in year seven and eight because I want good GCSE grades in year 11. I'm going to work hard in year 12 because that's going to get me good grades in year 13 and then I can get into university. It's almost like having those future plans and knowing that eventually I will get the rewards that I want but I need to work hard for it now. Okay and finally and again this that kind of links in with the final one of future time orientation. They have a plan it's about what's next, not what's happening now. It's about what's next. What do I need, need to do to get to that next step? Now, Bordeaux suggested that um, each class possesses its own cultural framework, what he refers to as this habitat. Um, and this habitat is what shapes views and beliefs and values. Um, and Bordeaux suggests that actually because schools have a middle class habitat because they are middle class institutions we it gives the middle class students an advantage but at the same time enacts symbolic violence upon the working class if you remember what we mean by symbolic violence we don't actually mean that people are beating up the working class it's not physical it's saying that their culture their foci their habitat is less than the middle class it's not as good as the working class and they should be aspiring to this middle class values. Now, the final one for cultural deprivation is something we talked about before, language codes coming from Bernstein in 1975. And Bernstein says that the working class and the middle class have different language codes. The working class are restricted. The middle classes are elaborate. And again, because the education system is um, built around middle classes, schools tend to use the middle class elaborated code. But children are socialized into these language codes from an early age. And working class children are more like are going to be socialized into this restricted language code of limited vocabulary grammatically simple, lots of gesticulation, it's context bound and it's particularistic, it's literal. They, there's not a lot of um, abstract or um, 
I can't remember what the other word was, but it, it's whereas middle class um, language codes are large in vocabulary, grammatically collect, complex, elaborated, abstract, and universal. They don't require context. When we when we mean what we mean by universal is they don't require context. They can be understood in any situation. Now Bernstein never said that the working class language code, the restricted language code, was any worse than the elaborated code. He just said that they were different. But the education system has again used symbolic violence against the working class by lessening their language codes and saying it's not proper English, which again can lead to educational underachievement. Now, whether or not you agree is up to you. But the final one we look at is this idea of cultural capital that comes from Bordeaux. And we have a nice picture there of Bordeaux, um, looking very suave. Um, but what Bordeaux means by cultural capital is being a having the economic, the cultural and the social means to transfer one form of capital to another. So, for example, he talks about economic capital, meaning money, property, land, location. He talks about cultural capital. And in this sense, it's your um, tastes, your arts your interests, your hobbies, things like that, and your social capital, who you are, who you know, where you're from. The idea of you get where you are, not by what you know, but who you know. And Bordeaux suggests that you can transfer capital between the three elements to create a better life for yourself. So if you have for example, he um, in terms of the working class, he says that they have low cultural capital because what they see, what their tastes, their arts, their interests are like are mass culture rather than high culture. They have low economic capital, meaning they don't have a lot of money, which leads to low educational capital and failure. So if you have high Whereas the work, middle class have high cultural capital, high economic capital, which leads to high educational capital and success. But that can go the other way. High educational capital can give you higher social capital. Because, again, you're running in those circles of not what you know, but who you know. There's a lot of people who go to private school that don't get their job because they're good at what they do. They get their jobs because of who their family is or who their friends are or the friends parents are um it's widely known that's how boris johnson got his first journalism gig it wasn't because he was a good journalist which we know quite really well um it was because of his family connections so by having these different forms of capital you can transfer that to another form of capital which can lead to, to help you lead to educational success if you've got high cultural capital, that gives you an advantage in school because you have the um, experiences that you can use to understand the, con the, the content that you're being taught. But you can't have high cultural capital without high economic capital. You can't go to the theatre if you don't have the money to pay for the tickets. You can't go, you wouldn't go to... Um, the, the, the opera or go to concerts or museums if you didn't have the economic capital to do that. Um, so the, these forms of capital can be converted into one another and they can either lead to economic uh, educational success or ec educational failure. So there are studies that actually back up this idea of cultural capital that um, cultural capital can lead to educational achievement. Sullivan in 2001 found that GCSE students who read complex fiction, watched serious TV documentaries, and who had graduate parents developed a wider vocabulary and achieved higher than other students. 
and these students tended to be from middle class income families. So when we're talking about these reading complex fiction, having a wider vocabulary, they would have heard this language and they would have seen their parents reading these books to them as children. Um, and that kind of develops the language skills and develops that cultural capital. You've also got Putnam, who called his study Bowling Alone. And he identif Putnam identifies or talks mostly about social capital. And he identifies the significance of social networking when realising what your potential. The idea being that if you've got high levels of social capital, you are more likely to consider yourself as having potential because you'd have more opportunities open to you by these connections that you have. And it's again that old boys network, to coin the phrase, and not what you know, but who you know, that can then create a sense of potential. And the sense of potential means that you're more likely to then apply for more higher level jobs. Um, because you look at the job description and you have to do that. I've got the potential to do that, I can do that. Whereas others might look um those without that kind of social capital where they haven't got those people to kind of go, well, here's an opportunity or here's a, here's another opportunity or here's something you could do, might kind of look at a job description and kind of go, Yeah, no, that's not for me. No, I I couldn't do that. I'm that's 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 above what I'm capable of. And again, it's a, the creation of the opportunities. The not what you know, but what who you know. And finally, we've got Gowit, who talks about the combination of cultural capital, marketization, and parental choice. So Gowit highlights that parents' levels of cultural and economic capital ha um, lead to major differences in parental choice and those marketization policies of open enrollment. So parents who have higher levels of cultural capital are more likely to use that to impress a school, um, to be able to understand school documents better where they use very complex language. And Gerwitz identified three types of parental choosers. Uh, parental parents when choosing education. I should say parental choosers, doesn't make sense. Um, so th they identified the privileged skilled choosers. So these are the people who are able to manipulate the system, game the system to get their children into schools that they want to. And that could be that they are able to move catchment areas. They're able to, to manage the appeals process if they don't get in on the first go round they're able to make themselves desirable to the school. You then look, identified the disconnected local choosers. So this is the other end of the spectrum, and this is where my parents fit in, where it was a case of, if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. It's the local school, it's fine. Um, so, and that was literally what my parents said to me when I asked why I was going to the secondary school I was. It was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. OK, so these are the parents who are just kind of like, it's a local school, that's, that's fine. They, they're disconnected. They're not engaging in that parental choice um, that, that's there. And then you've got those semi-skilled choosers in the middle who kind of understand the system, kind of understand the language, kind of understand what's going on. But perhaps if they didn't get in on first choice, are unlikely to appeal the decision. So these three studies kind of back up Bordeaux's um, view of cultural capital and how cultural capital can influence educational achievement from an outside of school, uh, outside of education perspective. So currently, so we've just looked at the, all the reasons why Educational underachievement by working class or disadvantaged students is caused by external factors. So in evaluating these, we're going to look at counter arguments and say, well, that's not the case. It, it's not just because of these external factors, the cultural capital, material deprivation, etc. There are other factors or just there are problems with the theories in themselves. So first of all, we've got Keddie, 
in 1973 who criticizes cultural deprivation theories by saying they're, a, they're blaming the victims. It's a way of saying that, um, and it, it's not just victim blaming, it's also symbolic capital, uh, symbolic violence against the working class. Kelly says a child cannot be deprived of its own culture. It's not that working class culture is less than middle class culture, it's just different. It's not deficient in any way, it's different. And the focus should be on challenging these prejudices against working class culture, not trying to eradicate or change the working class culture to be more middle class in order to fit with the education system. So for Keddy, um, cultural deprivation as a cause of working class um, underachievement is lacking because it's it's really quite as I said, symbolic violence against the working class and suggesting that they are lacking or deficient in some way, when in fact they're not. The other one we can look at is per, that, the idea of parental interest. And Blackstone and Mortimer in 1994 pointed out it's not that working class parents are disinterested in their education, but it's more likely that they're time poor. And what we mean by that is they're more likely to be working in shift based industries or working more than one job, working long hours in the job that they do have. So they're less likely to have the time to engage in education of their children. They're less likely to be able to sit down with them in the evenings and kind of go through their homework with them or attend parents evenings or do the sort of things that middle class parents can do, turn up to school events. A lot of these things take place during the school day when people are at work. Parents evenings. Now, it's slightly different now that we have um, online parents evening, which personally I prefer. Um, and it does mean and we have seen at the college as well with online parents evening, we have got higher levels of engagement. But also with, with work with um, parents evenings, maybe they can't get a babysitter for younger children. And you don't want to trek around parents evening with small children. There's enough children there when you're dealing with your with the one that's the parent the, the the parents evening is for. So Blackstone and Mortimer kind of again point out the symbolic violence against the working class by saying that their lack of engagement in the education of their child is because they're disinterested. And it's when it's not disinterest, it's being time. The language codes argument is criticised by Tronia and Williams in 1986 and kind of goes back to um, Keddie's argument of um, suggesting that the working class is deficient in some way. And um, Tronia and Williams say that to say that um the working class are underachieving because they're not using proper english they're they're not using complex sentences and it's because they're working class is actually again symbolic violence but also it's a classist way of looking at things and it's saying that again that the working class are deficient in some way when they're not deficient in any in any way they're just different and have a different way of speaking so schools need to change their attitudes towards language and that doesn't mean that schools should allow swearing um that's a, an accepted no-no but it should be that perhaps they should be more aware of um cultural differences in language um not just with ethnicity but in terms of class so that children don't feel that they are lacking in some way and oh, I'm no good at English because I can't talk proper English is is not true. We then got um, policies and the fact that there are policies in place to kind of help overcome um, this cultural deprivation, suggesting that perhaps there are other reasons why um, working the disadvantaged students are underachieving. We've got pupil premium to support materially deprived children. There are after school clubs for a lot of schools now run after school 
homework clubs where students are able to use school equipment to complete their homework before they go home. There's most schools now have hardship funds for uniform or have a uniform swap shop. Um, it's something that we do at the college in the summer term when year 11 leave or students have grown out of their uniform, but it's still OK. It's, it's still wearable. They're just too short for it or too small for it or too big for it. Sorry, big for it. Yeah, too big for it. Um, then the PSA, the Parents Support Association, actually create a kind of swap shop where you can donate or hand over old uniform and get new uniform at discounted prices. There's also the argument that um, children's TV shows now are bridging that cultural and language gap. TV shows like Sesame Street and CBeebies um, and things like that are creating programs which are developing language in um, children. It's one of the big criticisms of was of the Teletubbies is that they didn't talk properly. I can think of far more reasons why the Teletubbies were just awful and scary. Um, but children's TV now, is, they do look at the educational value of children's television. Uh, there was a, a programme that was on when I was small um called stop it and tidy up and um, it was a cartoon voiced by terry wogan um teaching children how to behave and all the characters were things that they that parents would say to their children stop it tidy up brush your teeth go and play and my favorite the big bad i said no um you can look it up on youtube it's the the episodes are only about five minutes long but you can look it up on youtube um, and finally, this whole argument, these external factors on um, educational achievement by class are very deterministic. It's very much saying that the causes of educational performance, uh, poor educational performance are being done to these children. There's not there's no agency involved in the sense that they don't get they're not given choice. Um, and to say that it's poverty or cultural deprivation um, and things like that, it, it's kind of suggesting that it's to being done to the student and they have little control over it, which leads, which is why it's deterministic. Now, next lesson we're going to be looking at or next lecture, we're going to be looking at the internal factors. So. It, there is an argument between whether it, which has more influence, the external or the internal, but also which of the internal, have, or sorry, which of the external have more influence? Is it material deprivation that has more influence on educational achievement, or is it cultural deprivation? Is it language codes? Is it um, parental disinterest? What? What, which factor has the most interest? So it is possible to get a relative importance question on this um, subject as much as it is to get a um, argument essay. But we'll look at that in a future lesson.